<laughs> right at the top of the football season start. I'd like to take the Bible if you want to turn with me to first Chronicles. together with all Israel. 
taken Cain according to the word of the Lord concerning Israel. Would you pray with me? Lord God, as we consider the men that supported David, that David remembered as mighty men, we believe in our day and age that we are called to be soldiers of the cross, that we are looking for mighty men and women of God to step forward in our age and in our time. I pray, Lord God, that this passage of Scripture indeed will connect with us in such a way that when we go to work tomorrow morning, that we are changed, that we are taking on a new perspective of the world around us because we have interacted with your word today. We pray your Holy Spirit might have his way with us today. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Before we can actually consider some of the mighty men of David, some of them we'll look at singularly, and some of them we'll look at uh, in, in groups of two or three, it is important for us to think about who it was that they were following. Why were they mighty men? Whose mighty men were they? They were David's mighty men. And there's a real connection there between who these guys became and the leader that they followed. Now I'm going to tell you straight up front, over the next few weeks there are several words that you are going to hear over and over and over again because they are unavoidable words as we talk about being mighty men and women of God for God in our day, in our age. You're going to hear the words leadership, loyalty, love, and courage. Leadership, loyalty, love, and courage. Over and over again in this particular study because I believe that the essentials as it is laid out in this particular passage of Scripture of what it means to be a mighty man or woman of God are found in those four key words. Leadership, loyalty, love, and courage. Among the people that are listed in this particular chapter and those that follow and that are found within the stories of David, and there are a few specifics, and mostly what David does is he is remembering, according to 2 Samuel chapter 23, as he is remembering these guys, he is remembering and recording some of their exploits. And that's what we're going to see. And when we're also going to be able to pick up some of the things that these guys were involved with in David's life itself and be able to draw out of Scripture actually what Scripture says. It is not our prerogative to add to Scripture. It is simply to say, what does Scripture say that it means to be a mighty man or woman of God? And how do we get that? We get that by extrapolating what it meant to be a mighty man of David. Among those that are numbered here, you'll find it interesting to know that there are 16 that are Israelites, but only 16. For a good portion of David's mighty men actually came from people who are named in the Old Testament as the bitter enemies of Israel. That's one of the things that's 
which is why the military has always been that branch that has majored on leadership. This is David's leadership. There are 16 from Israel. There are in these number Hittites, Ammonites, Moabites, Assyrian, and Gibeonites who were the people that lived in the land of Cana before Israel even got there. So David has surrounded himself with people that come from his bitter enemies, people that come from his closest friends. There are groups of brothers that are listed. There is even possibly a son and a father that are listed in this particular group. But before we can really look intently at this group, we've got to look at the man they followed. I'm not going to go through every step of David's life. Instead, I want to talk about what I've already mentioned, leadership, loyalty, love, and courage. And so we're going to summarize David's life around those four words this morning. Now, with your Bible in your hand, I want you to take a look at a few passages of Scripture with me. If you would, look at 1 Kings chapter 15. 1 Kings chapter 15. Leadership, loyalty, love, and courage. That's what is exhibited by these mighty men. And I would say to you, that they found David to be a worthy leader. And that translated into their lives of leadership. What does 1 Kings say? 1 Kings chapter 15. Verse number 5 is a summation of David's life. Because David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and did not turn aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. Now that's quite, quite something that the Bible should say about a man. That it can outline a man's entire life and say his entire life he never turned aside from following God except with one thought. Except one fault. Most of us, if you looked at our lives, it would be a fault here and a fault there and a fault here and a fault there. And sometimes we're hot for God and sometimes we're not. But David's life is summed up that he never turned aside from God in anything except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. I would put forward to you this morning that one Part of what made these guys mighty was that David was a leader worthy of being followed. David was a leader of worthy of being followed. Through and through, this was a man of God. Through and through, David was a man of God. We think about the story of his life as he was a shepherd. We think about his time when he fought Goliath or when he was running from Saul. Things that we're going to look at in summation in just a minute. But through it all, and interestingly enough, the episode with Bathsheba actually happened more toward the end of his life. And so when these guys are all following David, what they see is they some, see somebody who was real. He wasn't just turned on to God some of the time. This was a guy that was hot and passionate for God all the time, regardless of the season. Take a look with me, if you would, at 1 Samuel chapter 18. 1 Samuel chapter 18. This is the story of Jonathan and David. But it gives us, it gives us a snapshot into the kind of leader that David was. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse number 1. As soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. Jonathan loved him as his 
own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of his robe that was on him, and he gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. And David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him so that Saul sent him, set him over the men of war. And this was good in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servant. Now what I want you to see is David just didn't become a leader overnight. David was trained in leadership. Now I will grant you that there, are, there appear to be people who are just simply born for leadership positions. There are people who at a, a very early age, and often a lot of times we see this in sports, but we also see it in academics. We also see it in the work of the church. There are people that seem to rise to the top, that have what it takes to become a leader, but that's in an embryonic way. And interestingly enough, a lot of those, a, a lot of those early risers don't make it. Because what they fail to understand is that leadership is something that is not simply that you're born with. It is something that you are trained in. It is something that you learn. It is true that David slew Goliath as Saul's champion. But that's one, that's one giant on one day. But then, what does he say? He becomes, he becomes Saul's armor bearer. He is right there in the middle of Saul's camp. And, and Saul puts him over armies. There is real training. It's on-the-job training. But there is real training that is going on with David. And what the people see is they see that David is worthy of leadership. He's worthy of this training, and they are willing to follow him. They are willing to follow him. David is in training. You know, I was, I've shared with a few of you this particular story before, but I can remember back in college, and I, I was in one of my psychology classes. It was actually uh, child development. And, I, and our professor looked at us one day and she said to us, she said, you know, even if I was not a Christian and even if I did not believe anything that the church preached or taught, I would carry my children to church every Sunday, every Sunday night, and every Wednesday night until they left my home. And there was silence in the class because this was a secular university that she was saying this at. And she said, you know the reason I would do that even if I didn't believe what the church taught? She said, there is no school of leadership in ethics and morals and values. There is no school in leadership for young children like God's church that exists. None. David had been a shepherd, and all of a sudden, through one exploit with Goliath, he is immediately put into Saul's camp. Now let's think, Saul had his failures, but let's think about Saul for just a moment. Saul is the king of Israel. And one of the passages that we're going to read here in just a second is I'm going to show you the time period that this was taking place. What was happening during this time that David's on this rise of leadership. He is serving under Saul, who is the first king of Israel, and who did what no one else had done since Moses. Saul was able to unite all of the tribes of Israel under one standard. Now, if you read the book of Judges, from the time they came into the land under Joshua, they, they, they divided there was division among the clans. And if you read
read the story of the judges, what you find is that a judge was a military leader at one spot or another spot, but almost never over all of the tribes. Until you come to Saul. And Saul was able to unite the tribes. And David was in Saul's leadership school as Saul is doing exactly that. He is seeing how it is done firsthand. He is seeing great military campaign, campaigns firsthand. David is a leader worthy of being followed because he was a leader who loved God and was trained for leadership. I want to show you what it looked like at the time that David was on the rise. Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 22. 1 Samuel chapter 22. Like I said, this is just a summation, but lots of times we miss the summation when we try to read the whole story because we miss some of these verses. 1 Samuel chapter 22. Verse number 2. Now this is, David is uh, actually running from Saul at the time, but he is on the rise to be king. Verse number 2. And everyone who was in distress, and everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to David. And he, command, he became commander over him, and there were with him about 400 men. All right, now, now, so who, who are the people that are attracted to David's leadership? They are people who evidently at first were attracted to Saul, but then they begin to see the breakup in Saul's life. And so they are people who are in debt. They are people who are in distress. These are people who look at the world around them and they say, this is not the way it's supposed to be. Listen, if we are looking for mighty men and women of God to rise, it is in the time that we live in right now. We tend to think of mighty people coming out of, out of the good times when, when everybody's turned to God. Man, the church is on fire. Look at all of what is happening. Listen, it is the time of bitter distress. It is the time of division. It is the time of death. It is the time when people are looking around and saying, you know, this is not how it is supposed to be. It is then that God will raise up great, mighty individuals for Him. And that's exactly what was happening in David's day. These were people who were under subjection to the Philistines at the time. And we'll see that in just a moment. But what I want you to remember is that David was a leader worth following. The second thing I want you to remember is that David was loyal. These guys were loyal to David because they saw in David a real loyal. Now we're not going to look up a particular passage of scripture for this because this is scattered throughout 2 Samuel in the stories of David. What we know is that David was loyal to Saul all of Saul's life. We know that when David attached himself as the champion to King Saul and Saul put him over his armies, that David was under the authority of King Saul. Eventually, Saul turned on David and sought to take his life. The entire time that Saul was attempting to take David's life, what we know is that David was ever loyal to Saul. David never raised his hand one single time against Saul. He was always under the authority of Saul. He always acknowledged that Saul was God's anointed for that time and that place. That God would judge Saul, not David. And I believe that kind of loyalty that David exhibited in his life then played over to the people that were around him. They saw, these mighty men saw a leader worth following and they saw a loyalty worth imitating. They saw a 
David's love, or Jonathan's love for David in, in 1 Samuel chapter 18. Now, this is the last time that they are going to meet personally together. And you remember the story about the, the arrows and the boy, and, and there he is. Uh, there is Jonathan going out stealthily to meet with David. I want you to notice what it says in verse number 41. And as soon as the boy had gone, so Jonathan and David are left alone in the field. As soon as the boy had gone, David rose from behind the stone heap, and he fell on his face to the ground. He bowed three times. This is toward Jonathan. And they kissed one another, and they wept with one another, David weeping the most. At the end of Jonathan's life, as it is recorded uh, by David in 2 Samuel chapter 1, he talks about the fact that he loved, that David loved Jonathan with a love that was stronger than the love a man has for a woman. That was his example. I believe that these guys, these mighty men that were around David, saw a leader worth following. They saw loyalty worth imitating. And they saw a love that was real. They witnessed that the love that David had for Jonathan, and I think the love that he had for them, that they reciprocated that love. One of the things that, that has always interested me is gr growing up in the time period I, I did, and I know that most of these guys have disappeared uh, unfortunately, because that's that's just the way life happens. But I can remember growing up, I, I grew up around a number of World War II veterans. They weren't uh, lifers necessarily. They were they they had uh, either enlisted or had been drafted. They were in the army. They were in the navy. They were in the marines. And a number of them have been a number of battles, uh, both in the, uh, either in the Pacific or in European theater, and when these guys, and they were, they were, you know, in their uh, 50s and 60s, uh, when I knew them, and they would tell stories about soldiers at arms, comrades at arms, that they were with at Normandy or in Germany or in the Pacific, and they would talk about these guys that they had gone through basic with and then had fought beside them, they would talk about them with a love that I, I don't know any other way to describe it. With, with a love that was just amazing. Something, the war itself, the battle itself had knit them together. They weren't just people that they fought alongside. They were people that had saved their lives and that they had saved their lives and, and, and they had been in foxholes together. They had stormed Normandy together. They had been in the Ardennes together. They had been at Midway together. And they talked about these men that were a part of their lives with a love that was so deep and so precious that I'm not sure you can explain it with words. And that's what David experienced with Jonathan, and that's what David experienced with these mighty men who loved him so much that many of the exploits that we're going to look at over the next few what we will discover is that they were exploits of these men out of their love and their dedication for David. David's mighty men were mighty because they followed a leader worth following. They were mighty because they saw his loyalty and they imitated it. They were mighty because they experienced his love and they reciprocated that very real love. And they were courageous because they saw that David had courage. Look with me, if you would, at 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel. 
Samuel chapter 17. This is that famous story of David and Goliath. In 1 Samuel, Samuel 17, if you'll read with me in verse 38 and 39. Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head. He clothed him with a coat of mail. David strapped his sword over his armor. And he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested or proved them. So David put them on. Then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose five smooth stones from the brook, and he put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was, was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. You know, we like to romanticize David, young David, probably about 16 or 17 years of age at this time. We like to romanticize young David going into Saul's tent and saying, I'll go out and I'll meet Goliath. Saul clothed him in his own armor. Then David refusing them and taking just a simple slingshot. But, but, but we need to understand what was happening here. We don't need to romanticize it at all. You see, David was using what he needed. David was using what he needed. Saul clothed him in armor. Saul gave him a sword. And David's response when it was put on, I have not proved them. I have not tested them. I can't go against Goliath in Goliath's way. I've got to go against Goliath in the way that I know. We need to understand that way. I want you to look with me at what the Bible tells us. 1 Samuel chapter 13. 1 Samuel chapter 13. This is really important. 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 19 and 20, and then we'll skip down and read to verse 22. Now there was no, this is the time when Saul is fighting the Philistines. This is right before the time of Goliath. Look at this. Now there was no blacksmith to be found throughout the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make themselves sword or spears. But every one of the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen his plowshare, his mattock, his axe, or his sickle. Verse 22. So on the day of battle, there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people we saw in Jonathan. But Saul and Jonathan and his son had them. Did you get that? Saul was trying to unite the Israelite tribes. They were a people under subjection to the Philistines. As a people under subjection, the Philistines knew that there could be a rebellion. And indeed there was, led by Saul as he is proclaimed king. But to put down the rebellion, to make sure that it didn't happen, the Philistines did not allow any of the Israelites to be trained as a blacksmith to produce weapons of war. They didn't even allow them to produce their own agricultural implements. If they wanted an agricultural implement, they had to go to a Philistine blacksmith and it's listed here how much they were charged. They were charged an arm and a leg for what had to take place. They were people under subjection to the Philistines when Saul and Jonathan began to unite them. When David comes along, nobody in the camp's got a sword except for Saul and Jonathan. Do you understand now why nobody goes out to fight Goliath? Goliath is a fighting machine. He's got a sword. He's got a spear. He's enormous in height. And he is standing a bunch against a bunch of farmers and shepherds with pitchforks and hay forks. Nobody in the Israelite army has a 
sword, except Saul and John. And a king is not his own champion. Every day, Goliath goes out and he looks at all these farmers and he said, one of you plowboys want to come out and face a real man? And nobody's willing. Saul goes throughout the camp. I need a champion. I need a champion. Will anybody be my champion? Nobody rose to the task. A young boy comes bringing his brother's food from home by the name of David. And David heard what was going on. And you got to remember what the Bible says, that David was a man after God's own heart. David never parted, departed either from the, the right to the left from the commands of God, except in the matter of Uriah the Gittite. And that was years into the future. David arrives in camp. He sees what's going on. And he marches up to Saul and he says, I'll be your champion. Saul can't believe it's a teenager that's willing to be his champion. But at least somebody stepped up to the plate and Saul, Saul puts his own armor on David, gives him his sword. And David looks at him and he says, I can't use these. I don't know how to use these. I'm not trained in this. But I have been a shepherd. And I fought lions and bears. I've warded off predators from my father's sheep. Now you keep this. I know how to use a slingshot. Let me, let me make a comparison, if I can. The United States military is the strongest military that the world has ever known. And yet, we can move into countries in the Middle East and we fight year after year after year after year after year after year with the mightiest military the world has never known. We cannot bring those nations into some semblance of peace and control under the mightiest military, mightiest military that we've ever, that the world has ever known. We can't do it. Why does that take place? Because unless we can be, kill every civilian in the country and just start all over, these terrorist fighters have finally figured out that they cannot beat us at our own game because we have the best game in town. And we have figured out that you cannot possibly fight a people who are willing to strap bombs to their own bodies to blow us up. You can't beat that unless you kill them all. You can't beat that unless you kill them all. David looked at Goliath. When he went out on the field, when David made fun of his sling, or when Goliath made fun of his slingshot, and he said, I'm here in the name of the God you're defying. This is more about him than it is about me. And I'm not going to fight you in the way that you're used to fighting, because I'm not going to make it for them. I'm not trained in that kind of warfare. I'm going to fight you with a, what I know. There is nothing romantic about the slingshot and stones. It is what David knew. It is what when you stay out in the field with sheep and there's nothing else to do, that you sit and practice all day long. All day long. Until you get your hands. So good in fact that this big target, you can hit him right in the temple and put him down one stone. And that's exactly what David did. David used what he knew, but understand, the whole army knew how to use a slingshot. But all they saw was a guy with a sword and a spear that was taller and bigger than anybody they'd ever seen. I believe David's mighty men became mighty because they saw a man that day, a young boy, that day on the field, who did something no one else could do, he exhibited courage. You know, there have been times.
times when it has seen that society with its own morals and its own ethics and its own values has risen against the church and what we preach and what we teach as the right way to live and the right way to be. And what we need in times of distress and debt and subjugation is we need men and women of courage. Courage in the marketplace. Courage in the church. Courage in the community. Courage in leadership.